We are almost done with the fracture. The last step is just to assemble everything we've done and see if everything is working. Let's move down here where we have our out heli fractured. And these are all the fractures that we've done assembled in one place. Last thing we want to do is we want to animate both of our rotors. If I play, you can see the top rotor is animated. You can see that I am using uh, out front rotor uh, base here, which is the base that we created earlier. And I'm doing the same for the back. If you look here, I'm creating the same for the back of the rotor. And I'm using these two as pivots when I animate my top rotor and when I animate my back rotor. So now both rotors are animated. Uh, but remember, we fractured our helicopter in the center of the world. Let's go and view through the camera. We, are, we already have a helicopter, our original geometry that was animated. So now we don't want to redo the animation manually. What we want to do is take this animation and apply it to our fractured geometry so that from the very start, we are rendering exactly the same helicopter with this animation. And there is a very easy way to do that is we can use Extract Transform. And what it does, it will take the, our helicopter and extract its transform data. Remember, I packed this helicopter here, so it is represented by one point. And here I am extracting the transform of one point of the helicopter. And here you can see this is my little point moving. So now if I use transform pieces, you can see now my helicopter, all fractured, is using the same animation as before. Let's double check, let's template our previous animation. Let's move around. The only thing that is going to be different is the new geometry is fractured into many pieces and its rotors are rotating. But animation is the same. Perfect. Let's unpack it. We don't want it to be represented by one point anymore. Now we have all our packed uh, geometries, all our RBD packs. And here is our animated fractured helicopter that is that has all the original geometry, all the constraints, and all the proxies. But remember, our explosion happens only at frame 1430. So before that frame, I'm okay rendering what I see right now on the screen, this geometry. So I'm gonna do an RBD unpack. I'm extracting only my original geometry. I am adding a read time to it. Uh, we are adding read time because we have some rotors that are, let me just view them from the top. We have the rotors that are actually rotating quite fast. And we want to, to have some subframe data that we can achieve through a read time so that we have proper deformation motion blur. One thing you need to note is here in the read time, I changed my point ID attribute to point number, because if you look at my RBD unpack, I do not have an ID attribute. Okay, so that's why I'm using a read time using my point number, because my geometry stays with the same point count, it does not change. So it's easy for me to use. And also you see, I added a note here for myself that I'm using the interpolation cubic because otherwise rotors, they get transformed. We can check that. I'm clicking on bottom uh, left on my animation options. Let's untick integer frame values and let's go 0 0.1 step by step. So if you see I'm moving right now in the viewport, my rotors, it looks like they're rotating perfectly fine. There is no artifacts, nothing. Let's change interpolation to linear and you see what's gonna happen. The rotors are growing and then shrinking, growing and then shrinking. This is not what we want. This is gonna give us really, really strange motion blur. So instead cubic did it for me and the size of the rotors did not change. And I'm also computing velocity here because we manually animated our rotor, so there is no uh, velocity attribute. So now I have both subframe data and I have proper velocity. And this is something I will be referencing in my render. So until frame 1430, this is what I will be using. It's time to check that whatever preparations we did for our motion blur are actually working. Let's press one to go into the, our object context and let's go inside this render heli RBD. And you see we have a manual switch here, 
where in the left input we have just the animation of the helicopter with rotors rotating. Let's double check. Yes, they are rotating properly and they're coming towards the camera. And then as the explosion happens at frame uh, 1430, which will be the first frame of uh, our explosion in our RBD solver, that's when it's going to switch to the cache from the, from the RBD solver. But right now we still can check if uh, the rotators have proper motion blur. Let's see what we have here. Here we are creating a name from the glass group to be able to isolate the glass easily then in the in lobs. And after that, we're just deleting all the necessary attributes and we have some materials applied here. These are materials for us just to check here in the viewport that everything is working. The actual materials for rendering will be created in Karma in Lops. So I'm pressing two to go into my lobnet underscore test, and we are interested in this lob test 004. Let's put our visibility flag on our heli RBD. We make sure the helicopter itself is coming through. Let's view our materials, and let's go and view everything through Karma XPU. I'll give it a second to compute. Let's zoom in. I have a note here which says check glass cracking. So it's a good thing to double check that before the explosion happens, we are on frame 1419. We need to check that we don't see any cracks on the glass. The glass looks, looks really good to me. Remember, this is us using the RBD connected pieces and disconnected pieces that helps us achieve that before we want to reveal the cracks. That is working. Then we need to set up our motion blur. And there are a few ways how we can do that. First, I'm going to isolate just the helicopter. I don't want to see the buildings. Let me zoom out a little bit so that we can see our blades. And there are a few ways how we can set up motion blur in Karma. Um, please note that for either way for motion blur to work, you need subframe sampling on the geometry. This is why we did a retime and that why we made sure that between the frames we have proper data for the retime. Uh, first way to create motion blur is through a cache node. Let's view it. And what it is going to do is going to cache four subsamples around this frame. It just cached it, so which means that now this information is in memory. And right away, you can see in the viewport, we have motion blur on our rotors. And the way this is set up, if you select render heli RBD and you go to camera effects, you will see that first, our velocity blur is off. You do not want to turn it on when you need the deformation motion blur, which is the type of motion blur that we need when, for example, we have the rotors. You see, we want this line to be curved. And then we need to increase the geometry time samples. And please note that here, geometry time samples has number four and my cache has number four as well. So, which means that when the cache node is cooked, I am storing four values for the subframes. And this, and then I'm telling my render that it can use up to four values to calculate deformation motion blur. And if, if I put here 20, the result is not going to change because in the cache I have only four values. So keep that in mind that those two numbers, they need to correspond. Another way to do that is, let me view my render heli RBD. And another way is to use motion blur node. And this motion blur is going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to calculate uh, subframe samples for us. Okay, and here we have our smooth uh, motion blur. And here I have subframe samples to four, uh, same value as I have before. If you actually take snapshots, let's do that. The result when I used a cache node, let me snap it. And let me bring up my window. Here is the result where, with the cache node, you can see it here. And then let's do a snap with a motion blur. And let's snap it and then view them together. We have the same result. There is no difference. Either technique can work. I will show you an example later when I used cache node 
explicitly for a particular reason, but from what I understand from the documentation, either technique is uh, valid.